This is the Louis T. Network. Hey, either you're outside or you're in the lab room. Welcome, you are in the lab room, of course. I am your host, Lou. Thank you for joining me here on this program as we continue our wall-to-wall coverage of the 2015 NFL Scouting Combine. This is part two of day number two as I've broken down the wide receivers and what a group it was taking uh, part in day two of the scouting combine and they took up so much time so did the quarterbacks that the running backs almost were an afterthought at the combine in day number two I mean there were seven hours maybe even eight hours nine hours even uh, of combine coverage of day number two and literally Six to seven hours were slotted for the receivers and the quarterbacks. So that really gives you just a, a little bit of background as to how much <laughs> emphasis was put on the receiver and quarterback position. And again, what kind of league are we in now? A passing league. So it makes a lot of sense that those guys would garner the amount of attention that they did. But let's not forget about the running back position. And I think the running backs are starting to make sort of a little bit of a comeback. And again, we always talk about this league being a passing league and how you have to be able to throw the football. But, I mean, the Cowboys showed you last year. We've seen the 49ers. We've seen what Seattle has done. You, you've seen the blueprint is still there. You can run the football, play a little bit of defense. You can do some things in this league. And it's no secret that you must be able to run the football. Baltimore Ravens, prime example of that. Uh, last year, they had a solid passing attack. It really didn't scare you, okay? Joe Flacco, still that guy. You know how I feel about Joe Flacco. That's my guy. But look, they got it done on the ground with Justin Forsett last year. And, and that was the reason why they found themselves in the divisional round postseason game against the New England Patriots because they were able to control the line of scrimmage on the ground. You've got to be able to run the football in this league. And so even though it's somewhat of a lost art and maybe you don't see the prolific bats like we used to see of yesteryear where it was one guy getting the football 337 times. It's more of a platoon backfield nowadays, but still got to have bats if you're going to win in this league. And so let's start with the running backs. Day two, part two, let's jump into the running backs. Save the best for last, okay? We talk about quarterbacks all the time. They're, they're the most talked about entities in any draft, especially when the quarterbacks are actually good at the top of the draft. So we'll save those guys for last. We'll start with the running backs and we jump right into Amir Abdullah. Here's a guy, 5'8", 205 pounds out of Nebraska. I thought he was going to run a lot faster. I was very disappointed in his 40 time, ran a 4'6", 140 as his best uh, 40 time, he probably looked to improve upon that at his pro day, but very disappointed. I thought he would at least run in the 4 5 range somewhere. Really thought mid to low 4 5s. For what you watch him on tape and what he's done at college, you expect him to be a lot faster. You know, Mike may have tried to clean it up with Hayes a lot quicker than fast. I thought he was a lot faster than that, though. But despite that, he showed fluidity uh, in the on-field drills, and he also caught the ball exceptionally well. And I've talked about this already in, in other uh, combine videos, that th this running back group is a lot deeper than it has been in the, in the past, and you can tell that the game has changed. I remember watching you know, combines of old and seeing running backs struggle to catch the football. If, if there was a group of you know, 10 to 12 running backs that I was really focusing in on, four of those guys would be natural hands catchers, and the rest of them would be try-hard guys, maybe four more of those guys. Solid, solid catchers of the football, not natural hands catchers, but you can tell they worked at their craft and got better at it, and then there would just be four guys who just flat out couldn't catch. And so, that's not the case with this group, but just about all of them caught the football exceptionally well, and even Marshall Falk said, man, these guys can catch the football. And he was 
surprised and you could tell that it's something that is emphasized now that in this league, the way it's set up, you have to be able to catch the football. If you're going to be a third down back, you must be able to protect your quarterback as well as catch the football. You want to be a three down back? You must be able to catch the football. And so these guys definitely have taken heed to that message, all of them. And I mean, just about all of them caught the football well during the combine in day number two. But Amir Dula for me was a guy that I thought would run faster. He did it, but he did show the agility. He did show some quick movement, sudden change of direction, and he did catch the football well. So besides the slow 40 time, I thought he showed well at the combine. Jay Ajayi is one of my favorite backs in this draft. I've had the pleasure of watching him at Boise way more than I would have liked to. I see way more Boise State football than I'm supposed to. And at 5'11", 221, this guy is built like a statue. He's chiseled, love his size, he's a big boy. And he came in, and I didn't have any expectations for what he would run. I just said, hey, just go out there and let it all hang out, big boy. And that's exactly what it did, 4'5", 40. But that size, with the ability that he has to catch the football out of the backfield, he had 390 touches at Boise. Now that used to be a demerit for me. I used to actually knock guys for being overexposed and used in college. But after watching what Le'Veon Bell has done in the National Football League, L. Doc Bell has opened my eyes and said, hey look man, just because I was a workhorse in college doesn't mean I'm not going to be able to do the same at the next level. So Jay Ajayi is a guy that I love watching play football. Love his size, love his production. I thought he showed the speed for his size that I was looking for. And then he confirmed because he caught the football quite a bit at Boise last year. And so he confirmed that I could catch. <laughs> that wasn't a fluke. I had all those catches because I could catch. Caught the football well. Everything looked good. He checked all the boxes. I think he really helped himself. Jay Ajayi thought he had a strong showing at the combine. Javoris Allen, AKA Buck Allen, USC running back, six foot, 216 pounder. Thought he came out. I thought he just checked all the boxes. He, he didn't stand out. He didn't do anything exceptionally well. I just thought he came out and said, hey, I'm here. I'm a solid, dependable back. Had his best year by far at USC in his junior season. Could have went back for a senior year for what? He was the guy, got an opportunity, ran with it, thought he had exceptional production, and I thought he had a, a very solid combine. Just came out, ran 4 5, five 40, so he caught the football, showed some agility. I thought he did everything, checked the boxes, move on. So you move on to Cameron Artist Payne, out of Auburn, 5'10", 210 pound back. He's more of a third down guy, I see him as at least. So what I really wanted to see from him is, can you catch the football? Because you, I just talked about it. You're going to be a third down back? If you're going to be a specialty back, then you need to make sure that you can do the special things correctly, which means you need to be able to pass the tech, and you need to be able to catch it out of the backfield. I know he can run. He's a part of that Auburn backfield. So I'm not really worried about those things. And he came out, he ran a 4 5 three, 40. Not blazing, but not bad at all. And so, I thought he had a solid day. I, I thought he would be a little bit faster, but okay, 4 5 three is what it is. Uh, he's not a natural hands catcher, and I thought that Mike Mayock made some very valid points with him uh, not getting the football out of the backfield a lot in that Auburn offense. And so, uh, you really didn't get to see him catch the football, and you could tell he's a guy that doesn't catch it very often. Uh, saw some body catches in there, and some of those weren't his fault. You know, a quarterback puts it on your body, use your body, catch the football. He did that. He didn't drop the football, so he didn't hurt himself. It just, you can tell when guys are natural hands catchers and when they're not. You can tell that's something he's just going to have to work at. Not necessarily something he can't do, not something he can't get better at, but it's not something that is polished and ready to go as packaged right now. But nonetheless, thought he had a very good showing. And again, he came out, he competed. He checked boxes, you move forward. Melvin Gordon, arguably the cream of the crop at the top of this class. And really, it's Todd Gurley, it's Melvin Gordon, and then you can start to slot the rest of the guys wherever you like. But for me, Gordon, and I think this is the consensus right now because he's healthy and Todd Gurley isn't. 
he's going to be the first back off of the board and he's going to break that two year streak of no first round backs being selected in the NFL draft. And he just came out 6'1", 215 pounder out of Wisconsin, ran a 4'5", 240, which was what was expected. I was hoping he could sneak into that sub 4'5 range, maybe drop a 4'49 on this 4'48. Couldn't quite get there. 4'52, solid time either way. He's shown the speed, he's shown the agility, he showed the quickness at the combine, caught the football exceptionally well. He just looked so smooth, so silky smooth. And so everything he did just looked effortless. He just looked like he was floating on air out there. So he's one of those guys. Maybe the, the, the speed doesn't actually show up until game day, and maybe he's a 4-4-9 guy or 4-4-7 guy on game day. Either way, he's a dynamic player. He showed you the agility. He caught the football. He showed you exactly why he's going to be the first back off the board and why he is absolutely a three-down back. In this day and age where guys are specialty backs, the first and second down back, come out of the game on third down so somebody else can catch and pass pro, this guy can do it all. He showed a lot of those things at the combine. He solidified his spot atop this draft as the number one running back. You look at Duke Johnson. Here's the little scat back out of the University of Miami. The U, here's a guy that, I hate to put him in a box called him a scat back because at the U, he was Mr. Everything out of the backfield. He had to run between the tackles, he had to run outside. He was the, he was the bell cow at Miami, so I don't wanna put him in a box and call him a scat back, but at 5'9", 206 pounds, he's no Maurice Jones Drew. He's not a guy that's a battering ram that's going to be able to take and withstand a lot of punishment, but he runs tough, he's not afraid, he's fearless, so those are things and qualities that are going to help him, but I was expecting him to run faster, and he did it. He ran a 4.53. Again, not bad, but for a guy that's 5'9", 206 pounds, and again, when I watched him on tape, he just looked faster to me. I was expecting 4.45, I was expecting 4.48, I got four, five, three. So yes, a little disappointed there, but where he made up for the lack of long distance speed was in the agility drills. Man, can this guy move. The change of direction is out of this world. His feet are immaculate. He showed me why it is he's going to be an asset to some NFL football team. And oh, by the way, he caught the football very well. I thought he did everything other than the 40 with great efficiency he's going to be a back that comes off of the board fairly quickly in the draft i just want to see him run faster maybe he'll improve that time at his pro day but for the time being he's a four five three guy checked all the rest of the boxes duke johnson thought he helped himself at the combine jeremy lankford here's a guy out of michigan state 6'1 208 pounds so we're talking about a bigger back here but because he was a big back, I was expecting him not to be as fast. He said, hey, hold on, hold on. Don't do that to me. Don't put me in a box now. Let me out this box. 4-4-3-40, four, four, fastest 40 of any running back at the combine. So there you have it. This guy was moving. And the thing I like about the way that he carried himself was because he's a big guy. We've seen these upright runners. And they're stiff. They don't sink their hips. So they can't change directions very well. He was the direct opposite. The cone drill really highlighted the fact that he's been working to sink those hips, move his feet. He changed directions beautifully the entire day. I thought he caught the football well. He had some great production at Michigan State. I'll tell you what, man, he helped himself at the combine. If you didn't know a lot about him before the combine, I think teams are going to be forced to put the tape back on of Jeremy Langford and give him an opportunity to make a case for him going a lot sooner than many probably had him going before the combine. He definitely did himself a huge side with his performance at the combine. And lastly, TJ Yeldon, running back out of Alabama, 6'1", 221 pounds. I was very disappointed with his entire day, okay? There wasn't many things that I saw from him that I liked. And here's, here's what Marshall Falk said about him uh, during the combine. Marshall Falk said, look, earlier in his career at Alabama, remember, he was there when Eddie Lacy was there and he was the change of pace to Eddie Lacy. This guy looked dynamic early on in his Alabama career. I'm talking about... And maybe it's because Eddie was there and Eddie wasn't running as fast and then 
DJ Yeldon comes and spells him and he looks like he's a bird. Maybe that was it, but Marshall said, man, he was a lot lighter back then. He's about 10 to 12 pounds lighter than he was now, than he is now, and you can tell the difference. He, there's no burst, there's no acceleration. He ran a 4.6140, and again, he's a big man at 6'1", 221. That's big size, you know, big weight, but again, he was so much more dynamic earlier on, and I don't know if it's the leg injuries that he sustained over the last couple of years. I know he missed a lot of time, was in and out of the lineup uh, last year at Alabama, but he just doesn't look like the same guy that I thought, man, this guy's got potential early on in his collegiate career. And so, uh, he may, look, what I'm thinking, and, and I don't want to knock him too bad because I thought he went out there, he competed, and again, that's what I'm about. Go out and compete, show what you can do. Maybe he'll be Le'Veon Bell because I crucified Le'Veon Bell when he first came into the league because I felt like he was overweight. I felt like he was slow. I felt like he didn't fit what the Steelers needed. He went in the offseason after his rookie season, cut weight, got into shape, and look what he was able to accomplish in his second season. I'm hoping TJ Yeldon is able to drink from that same fountain that Le'Veon Bell did where he realizes, okay, I need to get rid of some of this weight. It's not helping me at all. Come back, get into some kind of shape, and then start moving faster. And I think that will help me because like him, Le'Veon Bell is a bigger back. He carries his weight well. He's a big, tall kid. And so is TJ Yeldon. So he needs to maybe cut down and go from 221 to maybe 209, 210, maybe 205. Maybe 205 is too small for him, but he needs to get rid of some of that because it's slowing him down. He's sluggish. He's not explosive. That, that cone drill was eye-popping because he was so slow in and out of those cuts. He wasn't sinking his hips. He looked stiff. I just, I was not impressed, but he did catch the football, which was a great thing to see. Maybe if he cut some of that weight off, maybe the rest will just fall in line for TJ Yeldon because he's lacking the explosion, he's lacking any change, sudden change of direction. Just really wasn't in love with what I saw from him at the combine. He needs to improve upon all of those things at his pro day. Let's move on to the main event, the quarterbacks in the this is a draft that's top heavy at the quarterback position. And one more mention of the running backs. Two guys in particular that didn't participate, of course, talked about Todd Gurley. He's going to probably be still a first round pick. Despite the injury, teams are going to test him out and look at the knee closer to the draft. And also, Tevin Coleman, running back out of Indiana, uh, is a guy that can flat out fly, can run. He was not able to go at the combine, so he's another name to watch out for at the running back position. Again, this is a deep class. Not a lot of speed necessarily, but this is a group that can get it done. And you saw that by the amount of names that I just mentioned. Sub the two names that I didn't mention because they didn't participate at the combine. Let's jump into these quarterbacks though. Top heavy group. We know about the two at the top with Jameis Winston and Marcus Mariota, but what about the other guys? What about some of these other tier quarterbacks? Look, I'm gonna tell you what, there may be one or two guys after the top two that go, and then you could easily see nobody else get drafted. You could easily go four, you know, five rounds without, the, without another guy coming off the board. It's very foreseeable. It's very feasible. So you, you needed to really see these guys come out here, throw it in person, and see if they can help their draft stop by going out and competing at the combine. And a guy I want to start with is Cody Fajardo. There's a guy that I watched at Nevada, and I said to myself, he's not Colin Kaepernick. He's not 6'4", doesn't have a cannon for a right arm, but he's just as athletic. He can move out of the pocket, he can throw on the run. He can make all the necessary throws. Again, not the strongest arm, and I really don't want to compare him to the guys around him just because it's not fair. A lot of these guys have absolute rifles. I mean, Marcus Mariota can throw with the best of them. Jameis Winston can rifle the football. Don't sleep on Bryce Petty. Sean Mannion is another guy that can throw the football. So I really don't, Brett Hundley, come on, are you kidding me? These guys can all throw the football. So I really don't want to compare him because it's not fair because those guys have absolute rifles. But uh, he's not quite on par, but I thought he did throw the football well. I thought he had zip on the short to intermediate passes, which means, hey, he can throw the deep out, he can throw the comeback, you know, the 12 back to 10. Thought he had a good zip on the football when he did throw it. Uh, the deep ball accuracy was a little lacking at times, but 
Lean, that's what you get with a guy who doesn't have as much arm strength, needs a little bit more anticipation. But I thought he came out competed. I, I like what I saw out of Cody Fajardo. I think he helped himself at the combine with his performance. You go to Brett Hundley, it's 6'3", 226, 4'6", 340 out of UCLA. And I don't know if I gave you the numbers on Cody Fajardo, but he's a 6'1", 223 pound quarterback. So again, 6'1", not going to really help him size-wise. 4'6", 340, so showed that athleticism that I referenced. He can move, and so he did himself a solid by his performance at the combine. But going back to Brett Hundley, 6'3", 226, 4'6", 340. So he's an athletic guy, has the size. And like I said, man, this guy, look, <laughs> he can spin it. When I say he can spin it, he was ripping it out there. He can throw the football. I mean, the question with him is, urgency with the footwork, getting out, you know, again, another one of these guys, a lot of shotgun, a lot of pistol, a lot of spread, so not a lot of reading defenses, not a lot of coming from under center, so these are all things, and that was one of the things I was really looking for, I, I, I knew he could throw the football, you're not going to be able to see if he can read defenses at the combine, so I was not really looking, I was looking at his footwork, and the thing for me was, how fast do you get back? from under center and he was just taking his precious little time gliding back and you know really and he's got a whip you know when he when he goes and snaps it so your footwork can be lazy when you can snap it that way but that's a bad habit to have and so that's something that I'm pretty sure teams are going to have him clean that up and I'm pretty sure the people that he's working with and, and they, they watched the, the combine they heard the comments and you know, Kurt Warner kind of critiquing his uh, mechanics and he's going to have to work on those things because he was definitely lethargic and lackadaisical coming back into his drop but once he let it go he's got some whip on that football and some snap but he's going to have to clean some of those things up and on some of these out routes, ball was behind. Just And again, that's all a part of him getting back in his drop faster so that he can anticipate and make better throws. He was missing to the inside. Can't miss on the inside. An outside breaking route, you're asking for trouble. You're asking for a pick six is what you're asking for. So those are some of the things he's got to clean up, but I thought he threw the football well, showed off the arm talent, and he showed the athleticism. Again, all it takes is one team to fall in love with Brett Hundley. To me, he's a more accurate, less athletic version of the kid that the Arizona Cardinals took in about what, the fifth or sixth round last year out of Virginia Tech. So I feel like he's got some potential that's going to have to find one team that falls in love with him and is willing to put in the work that it's going to take to make him an NFL-ready quarterback. Sean Mannion, here's a guy that I watched at Oregon State, 6'5", 229, this is a big kid. And he's got a big arm to match. 5'1", 640, so again, he's not running anywhere. He, he wants to stay in the pocket and do his work from there. And when healthy, he dealt with a lot of injuries at Oregon State. When healthy and when the pocket is clean, this dude is a beast. So he's one of these guys, and he's not going anywhere. You're going to have to protect him. But I thought that he might have thrown, outside of James Winston, I thought James Winston, we'll, we'll get to him in a second. Outside of James Winston, I thought he threw the most beautiful deep ball of the day. I mean, he was on the money. You can just tell, you can see the arm, you can tell that this guy's comfortable in the pocket. And, and some of those deep balls that he uncorked were just things of beauty. I mean, just dropping them in the bucket, feathery soft, with the gas! Ah! And so, uh, Sean Mann, for me, is one of these guys that, uh, if you're looking for a quality backup quarterback, come in, learn your system, and just sit and watch and grow. He's one of those guys, I can easily see him lasting in this league 10, 12 years and being one of those Sean Hill types down the road. If this, I like Sean Mann, I always have, and he kind of confirmed that at the combine for me. We move on to Bryce Petty. Here's a guy, I, I overlooked Bryce Petty. There were too many inconsistent games at Baylor. I mean, there were games where he would go 7 of 19 for 101 yards, you know, two touchdowns and an interception. They'd win. And I'm like, what are you doing, Bryce? I mean, what are you doing? <laughs> and so, uh, he's one of those guys I, I easily overlook. But uh, Bryce Petty showed me some things at the combine, 6'2", 230, out of Baylor. 4, 8, 7, 40, a lot faster than I thought. I thought he was going to be one of these statue quarterbacks you know, running a 4, 9, 8 or something like that. 4, 8, 7, not bad. So he went out, showed a little bit of athleticism. 
thought he actually came out and proved why he is probably going to be the third quarterback off the board. I thought he threw the intermediate routes beautifully with touch. He threw a very catchable football, especially over the middle of the field when they were running the dig routes. I thought he had great timing, led the receivers, gave them a chance to catch it and run it, not have to break stride. I thought he showed some things. I thought his footwork didn't look all that bad for a guy that primarily played in the spread offense at Baylor under Art Bryles. I was actually impressed a little bit with his footwork. Didn't think it was that sloppy. Didn't look like he was wasting motion. Thought he had the urgency that I was looking for from a guy like Brett Hundley, who didn't play under center as well. But I thought he actually had the, the urgency and got back into his drop fast enough. So, you know, there's a couple of things he might have to tinker with mechanics-wise when, you know, getting from under center. But it, it all looked solid. It all looked uh, somewhat polished. And I thought he performed well and solidified his spot as the third quarterback off the board in this draft. But those were all teasers. Let's just get to the main event, why don't you? So let's do that. And let's talk about the big two, Marcus Mariota and Jameis Winston. What's your flavor? What is your cup of tea? For me, I, I thought that, I and I fell in love with Jameis Winston a long time ago. The, the very first time I was exposed to Jameis Winston was on the ESPN program Elite 11. And it's a program that Trick Dilfer used to do. It's like a little camp where he gets these high schoolers in there and he's kind of preparing them for what's to come at the college level. And they go in and compete against each other and there's a winner. And Jameis Winston was the best guy there. He won it. And he was clear cut away the best football player, the best quarterback at that Elite 11 camp. Well, he was by far and away the best thrower of the football and best guy at the combine, if you ask me. I thought he was on the money. The post corner was lovely. The deep ball was absolutely ridiculous. The touch with which he throws is phenomenal. And I thought Daniel Jeremiah actually sent out a tweet that was spot on. His ability to change speeds on the football, uncanny. I mean. That's where you get that touch that I talked about. That feathery soft touch. I'm talking about that soft drugstore cotton touch where you put the football on the money over the shoulder. It's soft, it's a catchable football, but then when you gotta throw the comeback, you can zip it in there where that linebacker may be trying to knock it down. You're able to get it in there before he gets there. He was able to change speeds beautifully the entire day through the dig route. Well, I just thought he threw the football with such ease. He just went out and he ripped it and it just looked effortless. And I just thought he was the best quarterback. Mariota was not far behind. I thought he went out, showed well, showed exactly why he's going to make it tough on Jameis Winston because of the off the field issues, because if it was just on the field talent, I don't think it's even close in terms of who should be the number one pick, but you definitely got to take the off the field stuff into consideration with Jameis Winston and hope that he has learned his lesson, hope that he has turned over a new leap and hope that that is behind him and in the past. But Mariota for me went out, showed the athleticism. Let's give you a couple of numbers on these guys. Both of them are 6'3". Mariota, however, is 222 pounds. He ran a 4-5-2-40. So again, we know about the athleticism. We know about him playing that, in that spread offense at Oregon and, and what he was able to do with his legs and his arm. Meanwhile, Jameis Winston, same thing, 6'3". He's 231 pounds. There was a lot made about his weight leading up to the combine. He was able to shed some pounds and kind of dispel that whole notion that he was out of shape. And then he ran a 4 9 7 40. So again, that's not his strong suit. He's not a fast guy, never has been. Never has been, never will be. He's a guy that's going to kill you from the pocket. But I will say this, we saw that in the national championship game last year against Auburn. When he needs to tuck it and run, he will tuck it and run. And he's a big kid. He's a load to bring down. So uh, James Winston, when need be, he can run the football and will run the football. So don't think that he's a statue just because he's not fast. He will tuck it and run on you. So I just thought both of these guys came out and they competed and that's the biggest thing for me. They didn't run away from the spotlight. They didn't run away from the stage. The lights were bright and hot. The stage was big and bright and they came out and they performed like true champions. And that's what I want to see. Don't run. Don't run. Don't you run from me. They didn't run from me. They said, nah, man. You want to see what I'm about? I'm going to show you. I'm going to give you a little, I'm gonna give you a little taste. I'm going to give you a little taste. Can't show you everything. I'll show you the rest at the pro day, but it'll give you a little taste of what's to come. And so I was just proud to see these guys just go out and compete. You know how I am, you know how I like to do it and what I want to see. 
but they gave it to me. So kudos to both of those guys for coming out and spinning the football. And I thought they both were impressive. I thought they both made a case to be the first quarterback off the board in the game. What's your flavor? I already know what Tampa Bay is going to do. And I agree wholeheartedly with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. You take Jameis Winston and, and you just mentor him. You make sure you keep the right people around him. This kid is talented. He's special. He's got the swagger. You saw it. You listened to him talk. You've seen it over and over again. You've seen him address his team. The kid has just got it. He's got it. He's got that swagger. The dude is smooth, man. That dude is what you want in a quarterback. He's confident, borderline cocky. He's got all the, the traits necessary. Could he be more athletic? Sure, but it's not necessary because the guy can be cerebral from the pocket. He threw with the anticipation, he threw the zip, he threw the touch, he threw the deep ball well. I thought he did it all. I thought Mariota came out. He threw the ball with a lot of touch. He showed you exactly why if he can get the whole, you know, getting from under center thing straightened out, if he can get the whole reading defenses thing squared away, he showed you the arm talent is there. <laughs> there is no doubt about Mariota and the arm talent. The dude was, he was firing the football and it was accurate. There were some times when the ball might have been behind once or twice and that has been the knock on him is that he's inaccurate at times, but he threw the football well, he helped himself, he showed exactly why he's going to make it tough on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and he's not going to last. I've, I've seen mock drafts where he's at 10 to the Rams. He's not getting past the Bears at seven. He won't get past the Jets at six. So, miss me with all of that. These two quarterbacks will be gone by six. I feel like that will be the case. So that's day two for you in a nutshell, wrapping up day two. We'll move on to day three today, linebackers and defensive linemen. We're done with the offensive side of the football, so stay tuned as we continue to break down the 2015 NFL scouting combine here in the lab. And remember, if it happens in the National Football League, whether big or small, we cover it all here in the lab room. Come back and join me as I continue to break down anything and everything in the next football league. See you in a bit. Enjoy day number three. We'll come back. Break it down. Go ahead. Break it down. Break it down. There's plenty more where that came from. While you're here, subscribe to the channel. If you want more Louis T, be sure to follow me on Twitter at In The Lab Room or you can like the Facebook page at In The Lab Room. That's In The Lab Room on Facebook and at In The Lab Room on Twitter. Don't forget, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so.